So, next session. We're, um, we're going to shift gears now into a more intimate space. So, take a breath, drop the shoulders. We're going to be privy to a personal conversation between two Australian philanthropic leaders as they explore and expose their deeper sense of meaning and purpose. And this is a rare privilege. They're two public figures, and we think we know them. But we're about to meet them in a way that goes beyond what we see and what we think we know to the heart of the matter, quite literally. David Gonski, ACE, Chairman of the ANZ, Chancellor of the University of New South Wales, President of the Art Gallery of New South Wales Trust, and Chairman of the University of New South Wales Foundation. He's also a member of the APSIC External Advisory Panel and the board of the Lowy Institute for International Policy, a patron for the Australian Indigenous Education Foundation and Ray's Foundation, and a founding panel member of Adara Partners. He's also the architect of education system change that in Australia we so badly need, and his name has become shorthand for a fall. So David will be lulled into conversation by Arun Abe, Chairman and co-founder of Walsh Bay Partners and Chairman Advisory Board of the Australian National University College of Business and Economics. So Arun goes to sleep at night pondering little questions like, is it possible to be rich and happy? And how can we use money more wisely? A financial advisor, wealth manager, academic entrepreneur, best-selling author and philanthropist, Arun's passion is the search for ideas that help people thrive. His latest book, How Much Is Enough, draws on his latest behavioural research and will guide his conversation with David. So, David and Arun, welcome both. Thank you very much. Please come and take the comfy chairs. Good morning, David. Good morning. I think, uh, I think you mentioned you, you first came and, and chatted to, to one of these PA conferences, what, 10, 15 years ago, and there's about a dozen or so people? Well, it was probably just for me, but I think for the next speaker, <laughs> there were about 10 or more. Oh, 10 or more, right. Okay. So I, I don't know where all of you were, but it's nice <laughs> to see all of you. Yes. Now, I, I've, I've been travelling down from Sydney today, and one of the things I've learned from watching politicians be interviewed is if you ask a question at the beginning of the interviewer, right. that way you, you can actually stop the questioning or at least reduce it. Okay. So I decided that before you ask any questions of me, we really got to know each other back in about 2002. You just sold your business. Yep and I had the audacity to come to you and say, we've got these new things which were called PPFs, now called PAFs, mm. why don't you have one? And I've got to say, <laughs> yes, it's one of the that, easiest cells <laughs> I've ever had. You went off and said yes, but I never heard anything afterwards. So did you do it? And if you did do it, was it a good thing to do? Uh, yes, I did do it. And I guess the bottom line is, in some ways, to, to, to my surprise, it was, it was probably one of the most powerful things I've, well, actually, I think without doubt, the thing which has produced the most powerful moments in my life since. Um, it was a surprise to me for a couple of reasons. One, I think doing, doing something good was, was easy because I, I'd been my mother had drummed into me this whole idea that you, you need to make a difference. Um, but making a difference to me was how I spent my time, was about my career, about my work. If you spend 30 years and you start off life with no money, uh, actually giving money away, which was the, the trick you didn't m mention to me, um, is, is it's, it's a hard thing. That, that, that first check I wrote was about 10% of what we, uh, what we received uh, for the business. It was the hardest check I've got to say I've ever written, because the notion of after 30 years of working for the skimming it away, never having a chance to get it back was, uh, was, was hard. Uh, but I think the surprising thing was, I think you, you go into philanthropy thinking you're doing it for other people. And the reality is, and it hopefully does have a positive effect on others. You know, Larry Kramer made the point that you can also cause damage, which, uh, which is important to, to note. Uh, but the power, powerful effect for me and the family, I think, has been far more than, than what we've given. Uh, so I, I might share, share some stories you know, towards the end, but no, thank you, David. It was a, uh, 
a great journey in what you did with, with John Howard, I guess, about uh, almost 20 years ago in setting up the whole PATH infrastructure has been, been very powerful, and it's a, a reflection here. Um, now, I think uh, in that list of, uh, of accolades or positions that, that Sarah went through, and I thought there, there was the short list for you. So you, you've had extraordinary influence. You've had influence in a political domain with a whole range of prime ministers from, from either side of politics. You've been influential in business, you've been influential in philanthropy and so on. Uh, the extraordinary amount of drive which, uh, which underpins you. Um, and I guess it began in childhood. And, you know, you, I've heard a little bit about your, uh, about your childhood, about your father. I think your father came from Poland, uh, didn't know a word of English, but then within two years won the English Prize. So tell us a bit about, your, about growing up. Um, well, well I, I mean, my growing up for me, I mean, was not uh, a difficult story at all because, frankly, my father became a brain surgeon and mm. being a brain surgeon's son is actually it's quite riveting. The stories are horrible, but <laughs> the, the success is usually quite good and they usually are extraordinary people and he was an extraordinary person. My problem, and I think you raise a very good point and others may have different views, a lot of people make a lot out of philanthropy being the right thing to do and a good thing and we're doing wonderful things. I make it quite clear that my giving, whether it be in time or money, is for me. And the reason that I have to do it is I didn't become a brain surgeon. <laughs> it's, I mean, yes. Now, it's interesting for those of you who are well read, I see Jeff Kennedy's probably read it, The Economist in May of this year has an article which I really, for those of you who suffer from the same disease as I do, that you didn't become a doctor, you became a banker of all people. Uh, and but the one sad, yes. Yes, and you've got to give back. Um, read the article, it's called, if, uh, something to the effect of, if you want to change the world, become a banker, not a doctor. <laughs> and the essence of it actually is quite interesting. What it says is that doctors do wonderful things but they're limited in what they can do because basically they have just their hands, their brains and so on. So they see a patient or a group of patients and they might say one every day, every year or whatever. But if you can be successful in your chosen work or profession that isn't saving lives, you can use part of that <coughs> to actually be a multiplier for changing lives. And I think it's summed up well what drives me. What drives me is I want to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I believe, by the way, and I see a lot of business people here, business can make a difference. Sometimes we don't, but in general, businesses do make differences. But I want to make sure as a person that I do contribute. And to be honest, it's been a fabulous ride. And one of the things I'd also say is, for those of you who are getting to the sort of age I'm at now, the most depressing thing is people ask you questions about what you've done, and they don't ask you what you're going to do. Hmm. Okay. Is, is that a hint, is it? That's too rush. Okay. <laughs> um, Devin, what, what was your dad's attitude towards business, though? Uh, my father's attitude was not great to right. business. I remember vividly um, they were quite social people, and mm. uh, uh, there was a dinner at their home, and the, the people left, and I recognised a face of a man as he was leaving. I think I'd seen it on the front page of the paper, and I said, who's that? And he told me who it was, now deceased, and I said, what does he do? And he says, oh, he's just a businessman. Right. <laughs> and that stayed with me mm. now almost 45 years since that event, that to him, Business was not that meritorious. Um, he had quite a lot of friends who were in business. Yeah. A lot of them were very wealthy. And in those days, I don't think he felt they were contributing. And I remember vividly him visiting my offices when I was a lawyer and looking around and seeing how wonderful the offices of that law firm were, which they were, and saying to me, when are you getting a real job? Mm. You know, when you're actually going to understand what goes on about 30 floors down mm. from where we were. Well, I suppose as compensation, though, you, you did actually marry a doctor, if I, I recall it right, and your daughter's a doctor as well, so uh, at least there's been some, some family well, balance in that. Well, no, I'm a hypochondriac. I want to make <laughs> sure that I've got free medicine. <coughs> you know. um, to, to go to bank, I mean, you've taken on two of the, the big hot potatoes. One, one is, is banking and the other is, uh, is, is education, come to education. Um, 
of, of the many things you could do, and in, in taking on the chairmanship of, of ANZ, uh, you, you gave up a, a number of other things. Now, you know, David, you know, bankers have never been popular. And this goes back in, in history. I mean, you know, Charles Dickens wrote about this. So why, why, why take that on? Yeah, I think, um, by the way, I, I took it on with my eyes open. I had uh, many, many years previously been a director of the ANZ. So I was coming back for a second coming, so to speak. And uh, I feel banking, and I know there's a lot of criticism of mm. it, but banking does amazing things. You know, there's a lot of talk about bad things that banks do, and they have done bad things, but they've done a lot of good too. When you look at the size of the four big banks in Australia, the amount that they lend for business, small business and so on, they are a vital artery of the community. And I've always been almost mesmerised by banking, the good and the bad it can do. Mm. And I suppose, for me, it was a logical step to step up and perhaps see if I can do some good. But having said that, I think that banks are vital, and I don't think anybody's arguing that they're not. They're certainly vital, but um, you know, putting aside the, the commercial elements of, of, of being chairman of, of ANZ, and, you know, clearly it needs to perform well as a commercial <laughs> entity. What would you hope, under your stewardship, if you're looking out five years, what additional things might it do? Well, I think that we've already started. I mean, the first thing I did, I mean, as a chairman, the first thing you must understand is you don't run the organisation. And I suppose that even goes for Philanthropy Australia, Alan. I don't know whether that's true or not. But the chairman sits there and basically uh, runs the board and so on. So the first thing I did was I appointed, when it was appropriate, a CEO that I felt had my values and had a real understanding of you know, what the world expects. Mm -hmm. And I believe Shane Elliott is exactly that person. And if you don't agree with me, then you haven't read really what he's been saying. Um, he takes a very strong attitude. He's a, a boy from humble origins in New Zealand, and he understands it's not just about making money. And I think that we've got 46,000 people working for us. And yeah, some people will make mistakes. Some people will do bad things. But overall, they're very good people. And they're people who are wanting to make a difference. And what, what, what might that difference look like, though? You know, five years out, how might ANZ be different in terms of those other, other dimensions? Well, I think ideally? that you know, we will be different in the sense that we are honest and open. I think that we'll be different in the sense that we look to our customer hmm. and try and do what the customer is aiming to do. And I think overall, even though there will always be mistakes and so on, when we make a mistake, we will seek to fix it and own up to it. I was driving down from Armadale um, last year. It's for, for about 100 to 150 kilometres in paddocks, in farmers' paddocks. I saw signs with your photograph on it. And it's, you know, give a gonski, don't give a gonski. So your name's become a verb, an adverb, an adjective. <laughs> um, so this whole education thing is just, you know, it's, 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 it's a huge thing. I, I, you have a passion for education, as, as do I. Um, but education policy is just this massive thing, which is always going to attract attention, um, controversy, and so on. So you've been praised and, and both attacked. Uh, Again, why? What, what, what is behind you You're getting involved? Yeah, that's quite an interesting thing. I mean, I don't know whether any of you, some of you would have, um, have just had a call out of nowhere. But in 2010, I got a call from Julia Gillard, who was then the Education Minister. And I'm not sure I'd actually ever met her. But she said to me that she wanted to do a review into the funding of education. And she thought I'd be the right person to do it. And I remember my initial thought was, that's ridiculous. I'm not an educator. I was a chancellor, or still am, hmm. a chancellor of a university. Um, but I'm not trained as an educator. So I, I thought about it. And I'm actually, which is unlike me, I said, give me a couple of hours and I'll get back to you. And it suddenly hit me that it's probably the best thing I'll do in my life, hmm. in my professional life. And I think it has been. And I realised very quickly that there were a number of things that were terribly important to me. The first of which, if I revert back, if I may, to my father, 
I mean, my father was a poor boy who came to a country that spoke English and he spoke Polish, hmm. as you mentioned earlier. And because of some generous people, he got on a scholarship and then got a, a series of scholarships and, as I said, became a brain surgeon. The effect for him was he didn't have to go into the family business, which was basically selling cloth door to door, not something that survived the internet, so to speak. Mm. Um, and the second thing he, he did was he was incredibly productive. I mean, my grandfather was a wonderful man, and I think intelligent, I don't know. I think he was intelligent. He was pretty sad about life. He didn't achieve a great deal. Um, whereas my father achieved a great deal. Mm. And the difference? Education. And I realised that in the hours I pondered what Julia had asked. Mm -hmm. So I said, yes. Now, many in the audience would say, what an idiot. He knew nothing about the subject, but he knew the answer already. Well, I promise you, we put a lot of effort, nine months, into our first report. Mm -hmm. And the concept of helping the disadvantaged, of making sure that demography didn't designate destiny, became an absolute obsession of mine, still is. And I'm actually quite proud of the report. I accept there are probably people here who don't agree with it, uh, but often they don't agree with it because there wasn't enough money for them in it, hmm. to be honest, for causes that they're close to or whatever. But I think we did a pretty good job, but it was definitely motivated to look after the disadvantaged. So maybe just elaborating on that a bit without going into all the detail of the report, which is substantial. What, what was the essence of the problem that you identified and, and what's the essence of, of the, the solution? The essence of the problem was basically that I'm not saying it was right or wrong, mm. but that all additional monies had been injected into education, but not where we felt it should go. Mm -hmm. In our view, those who uh, had a low um, uh, economic situation, they were, you know, were deprived in terms of their well-being and so on, in the indigenous, those who didn't have English as a first language, um, and those who were in remote Australia, and those who were disabled, suffered badly and indeed money was not being put towards the things that could make their life in education better. And absolutely I stand by it that those five categories that we identify, and I do enjoy they're used all the time now, mm -hmm. those five categories do not in any way mean that the person um, that's got them is not bright. Hmm. You could be brilliant and have and come from a non-English speaking background with no money or whatever. You should be given a chance. So what we did was suggest use this to make sure that monies go to those sort of people. And I actually get, I, I don't know about these things you've seen in Armadale with my picture. In fact, I'd put to you mm. that my name, Gonski, drifted away from me. No, you know, it certainly, it certainly It's has, not yes. like Kenneth and whatever. <laughs> it was, there's no picture of me at all. It's a concept. Mm. You know, and people use Gonski 2.0 all the time, and I'm not yep. quite sure I know what they're talking about. Mm. I, yeah, I, I did Gonski 2.0, but it has nothing to do with funding, by the way. It's to do with teaching but, right. and other things. Mm. But I would say to you that, so that drifted away, but I still get a buzz mm. when people say the Gonski money is doing this. And I can tell you, when you go into the schools, and I'm still invited and hopefully will be for years, to go to schools and see what they're doing with that extra money mm -hmm. to help the disadvantaged. So I made the mistake of turning on the, the, the television last night, and the ABC, I'm not sure if you saw it, but it was on the drum. It had another half hour on, on Gonski. I'm not sure it was one or two. or. Or, or the essence of it, but is it going, do you think, in the right direction? I feel all the political debate and arguments and so on, you know, is it going in the, in the right direction? Well, I, I mean, that's a question everybody asks me and I never answer it. Hmm. Um, I, I think that if you look at the past, what has happened is we've had a coming together of both parties that you should fund in relation to disadvantage. You know, in other words, it should be based on some formula of, uh, to assist the disadvantaged. That's a success, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. What the parties decide, or the government of the day decides to do, is really up to them. I've written the piece. I, th I think that, obviously, what we put was right. Mm. I would hope that what we've put in our most recent report 
years put in, but that's up to government. And it's not for me then to be like a, an old, uh, I heard a Supreme Court judge has been talked about. Supreme Court judges should give their decision and move on. That's what we've done. We've written the report. It's not for me to be an arbiter of who's doing right with it or whatever. Okay. Um, I think this is about the, the 10th anniversary when, uh, when we actually first had a conversation around how much is enough. And you, uh, you launched the first edition uh, of, of How Much Is Enough. Um, so to start with that question, maybe from your viewpoint, just that whole issue of, and how you've thought about how much is enough, and how, how do you actually think about that for you, for well, you personally? Because I want you to deal with me kindly, his book is fantastic, by the way. <laughs> and there's only one thing better than the first edition, and that's the second edition, which he's got there. Um, but can I say, I don't know the answer to how much is enough. Yeah. But the interesting thing for me is threefold. First, I am perceiving, and it may be just shown by the number of you here today, that a lot of people are asking that question. Hmm. Do I have enough? Can I give it and to a higher purpose? And I think that that's something that 20 years ago was not being asked. And if it was, it was pretty uh, <coughs> minorities that were asking it. The second thing I would say is, it is essential that we ask that question. Because it's quite interesting reading the paper today, which apparently the figures don't actually show that the haves and the have-nots have actually become polled apart in the last 10 years in this country. But it feels that way. Yes. Yeah. And I think that it's incumbent on those of us who've got more than we need to at least contemplate that question and do something about it. And the final point comes back to the first that we talked about. I think there is a higher purpose than just spending on another holiday or indeed another you know, motor vehicle or bigger house. Mm. The joy of actually doing something that actually has an effect, I can definitely speak to. I mean, it is a buzz mm. to have started something in the education field. And I believe there's going to be at least one, like my father, somewhere there who has profited from it. Well, it might, might be worthwhile just um, reflecting on that conversation of 10 years ago, just drilling into you know, a bit more detail of the, of the problem we're, we're trying to solve. So I think the, the underlying problem is a paradox I perceived, um, which is, it's called the Eastland Paradox after Professor Eastland of, of, of Oxford University. What he observed was since the Second World War, wealth, is in, at least in, in Western countries, is, has massively increased. It's, it's roughly tripled per, per head. And for the first time, really, we've seen a middle class arise in, in, in a reasonable part of the world. Uh, on the other hand, measured happiness, the good news is measured happiness didn't go down. The bad news is it, it didn't go up. So there's, there's not a simple relation, a relationship there. Um, but over that same time, we've seen a massive increase in stress, anxiety, depression, which goes just beyond a measurement effect. We've seen a, a tripling in, in youth, youth uh, suicide. At the time I began to research the book, you know, having two, one of my sons is here, having two teenage boys, uh, and seeing what was happening to youth, and especially actually female, uh, you know, uh, to teenage girls, it was, it was just massive. So that there's this complex relationship, I guess, between, between money and, and well-being. And having been in the financial advice and, and wealth management business, I, I thought I was getting into a business where it was about, about economics. And I didn't realize when you start dealing with people's money, you start dealing with their lives, which I was uh, completely un unqualified to do. Um, the, the good news, I guess, in the last 20 years is that, uh, as Sarah mentioned in her introduction, there's been this rise in behavioral research, which has given us much more insight into our behaviors around happiness, uh, and also our behaviours around money. And my interest was really in, in con connecting those different you know, pieces of research to, to look, look, look the whole topic in, in more detail. And I think one of the things we, we've learned, David, in, in our discussions is that when you learn about money in, in school and university, it sounds like some sort of inanimate thing. It sounds like you know, legal tender. In fact, money is a great emotional force. Um, I think you know, money, sex, religion, uh, power, you know, these are things which people change their behavior. These are things which people actually, uh, actually kill for. And money actually requires great, great emotional skill to, 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 to learn how to use wisely. Um, and this whole idea of purpose, having a sense of meaning and purpose, is, is a very powerful way of starting to develop the skills, I think, to use money better. 
So I think maybe, you know, first of all, looking backwards, but then looking forwards in terms of, you've alluded to the fact that what you've done in education is, is the most meaningful thing. Is, is that really the most meaningful thing you've done? Or what, what, what are some well, of the others? I mean, the so first far? thing I, I think is, um, you know, as I, I looked at the list of people who are here, hmm. um, there are many in this room who've done much more meaningful things than I have. And that makes me hungry, frankly, hmm. Hmm even though you think I'm a geriatric, to keep, <laughs> to keep going, to do further things. The world is still not a great place. It needs help and so on. The second thing I would say is over the last 20 years, I've noticed you know, power is a great thing, but a lot of people are extremely happy having success in other forms. Hmm. I, at the university the other day, I watched a young woman, 25, 26, a postdoc as we call it, she's got her PhD. I saw, she was refilling various test tubes, she probably doesn't call them test tubes. She was researching into AIDS and she showed me on the screen what she is actually achieving. And they also had an ovarian cancer presentation on the other side. Hmm. I actually think their meaningfulness, even though I know we don't pay them that well, is amazing. Mm. And you could see it in their faces <coughs> that they are not only satisfied but striving mm. for a much higher thing. So I think there are a lot of people striving for that and should. In terms of meaning in my own life, I would have to say there are events, we all have events where you feel meaningful. My own family, we, we celebrated being here in Australia 50 years, and I decided we should do something substantive, and we decided we're going to solve scabies hmm. in New South Wales. My wife is a paediatric dermatologist. She's got a lot of people coming down on trains and so on for scabies, and we're going to do it. So off we set to do it. The first thing we found is wherever we went, there were no scabies, which is great in one way, but was a bit foolish in another. <laughs> But what we did see wherever we went was that there was a dentistry problem, right. a massive dentistry problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm leading to the fact that over a year we worked with the Royal Flying Doctors mm. and we actually created a flying dentist. Mm. By the way, if you're in Queensland, the government's got one. In Victoria, they've got one as well. We didn't have it in northwestern New South Wales. The most meaningful time probably of my professional whatever life mm -hmm was standing at Lightning Ridge International Airport, which if anybody's been there is a right, shed. International, right. Yes, international, say, yes, it's yes. called International Airport. Right. It's a shed, mm -hmm. and I watched mm -hmm. our plane coming towards us, the Royal Flying Doctor plane with the dentist, mm. and I was literally holding the hands of the two doctors, my wife and my daughter. And as that plane came, and the, the dentist came down with the nurse and the, the uh, dentist uh, hygienist, and so on, that was almost a euphoric moment. Mm. And by the way, later on watching him operate on a kid who'd really damaged his teeth in a state, uh, in, in, a, in a skateboard accident, was very meaningful. Fantastic. Sarah, we might just uh, segue this conversation into, into the audience since we've uh, got, got it to see if anyone's got comments, thoughts, questions. <laughs> Jeff Kennett's been the target of many, uh, many comments so far. We'll see, give him a right of response. <laughs> Uh, hello, Liz Gillies, Menzies Foundation. Uh, Arun and David, thank you very much for a really interesting insight. Um, I recently uh, released some research that talked about uh, the barriers to philanthropy achieving more in terms of its ambition. And one of, in the 20 or 30 interviews I did with a range of people in philanthropy, one of the themes that kept emerging, which I think is different to the way you two practice your philanthropy, is the extent to which often governing boards, directors, trustees and those sorts of people don't necessarily bring the same expectation of rigour to philanthropic practice as they have in other areas of their life. You're both great exemplars of people who apply all your skills in everything that you do in the context within which you work. 
But the clarion cry from the people I interviewed as part of the research project was, we want to convince our boards uh, to be more strategic and more ambitious, but we're just not how, sh to how sh we can do that in a way that allows us to work you know, in a much more uh, rigorous and um, strategic way. I just wonder if you could comment on that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy, happy to comment on that. Mm. First thing I would say is one of the things I find amazing, which is in support of what you've said, is over the years I've dealt with people who've spent years carefully nurturing their own assets, carefully investing in things and doing very well, and then when they decide they're going to give, they just give it uh, with no real rigour. So I've obviously noticed the problem. But I would say to you, and I'd also, if I may, before I give a bit of a solution to it, I've also noticed that some business people actually go the opposite way to what you're talking about. I recently mm. sat through a meeting where there were all these KPIs on the amount that was going to be donated for a particular cause. And I controversially at the end said, what about a KPI that relates to one's heart? And actually looks to see what that money's actually doing mm. through that lens. And needless to say, that wasn't the most popular thing because it's hard to put a number on a heart. Um, but I just make that point. In terms of people saying that to you, I'd have to say I'm a little bit disappointed in them because I think that boards are usually receptive to what's put to them and how it's put to them. And I have noticed in my travels on many, many boards that often the sponsorship proposals are much more exciting than the philanthropic ones. Sponsorship usually has pretty people running around on a TV set or whatever, and then why don't we give $100,000 to this cause or whatever. You need to work on it the same way you work on any investment. And by the way, you add obviously the heart, but you also look at it that way. And you need to sell it to the board that way, and you can get Boards are not usually dead from the waist up. They're actually awake. And they can also get very excited, and I've seen it. And the final point I'd say, the point you made is exactly why we started the Centre for Social Impact. And I think uh, Christy Muir is performing here later. I mean, basically, I can tell you, we set that up so that we could get into business and thinking the concept of what you should expect, what you can do, and how you can check that it's properly happening. And uh, I think that if you could do your research in another five or 10 years, I would hope that the result will be different. Thank you, David. Now, actually, Mandy, I'm sorry, the mic's gone over here, but so we will come back to you. But question here. Dave thank Kennedy. Uh, thank you, uh, David and Aaron. And uh, let me just say, Chancellor, happy birthday, 65th birthday next, next month. You're not a geriatric. Like your father, David, I was a benefit of scholarships, and I definitely agree with you on education is the way to help people up. But I wanted to sort of reframe this, because we have a lot of fundraisers in the room as well as philanthropists. Not how much is enough to give, but how much is enough that you have that you know now that you can give, because that was my problem. I always knew I wanted to give back, but I couldn't get around third base to get the home plate to say, okay, now I have enough. And of course, I had some experiences that changed that. So that's the question I want to ask you both. Well, you can give the authoritative answer, but I'll give the simple one. Yes, you, you, I, you know, I, 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 how many I, I, times in life have you actually seen something that you might want to buy and you're not sure you can afford it and lifted your expectation? Most people do for their first homes. In my case, I've done it for every home I've had, pushed myself a little bit harder. My argument is, in the philanthropic, the giving space, if it makes you feel you want to do it, then you will come in some way to a decision of whether you can afford it or not. And often, your mind is there, whether you're going to pay it off over time. It's the same just as buying an item, except if you've already got so many items, it's an extra item that's got a bigger, in my opinion, opinion bigger payback uh, for what you're doing. 
So I would say I can't answer your question, David, as to whether, um, you know, how much is enough. I'll hand over to Aaron to do that. But on the other hand, I do know that you can come to terms with giving when it's something you want to do rather than you just think they want you to do it or it's somebody you don't want to say no to, et cetera. Now, I think my quick comment is that philanthropy and the power and the joy of it is actually a learned experience. You actually learn it by, by doing it. Um, and it's surprising. It's one of those, like the, the experience with, with buying things, you have the expectation that something you buy is going to make you this happy. And the, the, the lived experience tends to be a very quick um, diminution in, in, in happiness. And philanthropy is actually the, the, the reverse. Uh, you expect that giving away money will make somebody else happy. You don't actually, you underestimate how happy it'll, it'll actually make you. And the only way to actually discover that is not, frankly, you and I telling people that, it's, um, it's actually doing it and, and experience it for yourself. I just have to say, I spoke to, is Wendy Scaife in the room? Where's Wendy? Hi, Wendy. I talked to Wendy, I know this week, last week. I love talking to Wendy because you learn something every time you talk to Wendy. She taught me this new term, psychic poverty. Is that right? So where you feel that you don't have enough to give, but actually everybody has enough to give something. Um, Mandy. Mandy Village um, Collier uh, Charitable Fund, where one of our, um, the, th the three sisters who established this fund back in the 1950s, one of the areas they wanted to support was public education. Um, uh, David, I'm interested in um, your, what you want to do now in the education space, because it seems to me that, it's, you know, that, that there are still some really complex problems, perhaps just to pick one, we're not attracting high quality people to be teachers. Um, we're dropping the standards, or the, the levels required to get in to be a teacher. Teachers are chronically underpaid um, and underloved. Um, that's just one thought that I had that you perhaps might want to <laughs> get stuck into, but I'm, um, I'm more interested if you have got any ideas as to what you might do to build on the work, the very fine work you've already done in that area. Thank you. Well, can I start by saying, firstly, um, I don't agree that we're not getting high quality people as teachers. I accept your point that there may be, if there's such a word, non-high quality people who are teachers, but you shouldn't take the other thing, which I don't think you, you believe. There are lots of first-rate people going to teaching. If you're saying we would like some more, I agree with you. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind that the teaching profession is loved. It's not a not loved profession. You should be a banker to know what a loved <laughs> profession is. Um, uh, teachers are loved, and indeed what we have to do, I think, is to recognise that more broadly. And for any who bothered, and it's just me, my mother, and two others who read it, um, my review, that's, we do talk about things that can be done to actually elevate the teaching profession. But it's a wonderful profession, and there are some very good people in it. In terms of public education, I mean, the three sisters you talked about, if they were thinking of that in the 50s, they must have been formidable and wonderful people. And it would have been hard to do that, because it wasn't until my report of 2011 that we attacked the problem that you couldn't give money to public schools, per se. There were ways through PNC and maybe the odd building fund, but it wasn't easy to do. Now with Schools Plus and so on, it's a lot easier to do. But it, I think it's a wonderful field, the public education system. And I think in time, I would predict that a lot of people, worthwhile people, even more so in terms of number, will match those worthwhile ones already in teaching and it will become a much more leading profession. It's a solid, um, you know, good job with enormous perks. And what are the perks? That you produce wonderful people who often, and certainly I'm one of them, remember the teachers in their lives who changed their lives. David, you, uh, you began with the first question, so I'm going to bring this to a conclusion, uh, Sarah, if you don't mind, with the, uh, with the last story um, and, and comment. Um, and I, I said you know, that the journey you, you encouraged me to start 16 years ago has produced some of the most powerful moments in my life, and very briefly, this is one of them. 
Uh, I've been on the Smith family board for about 12 years and understanding the, the challenges of, of kids with a, a disadvantaged background. And as I had a function at, at the ANU and, uh, and the Smith family some years ago, and a, a young Smith family scholar got up and, and spoke, and there were three sentences he, he said, and some of you have heard this before, but it's, uh, I won't apologise for it because it's, uh, it's so powerful. There were three sentences he said, which I'll, I'll never forget. Um, the first was he was, um, he said, I was a, uh, um, I, I never knew, knew my father. He was a drug addict, alcoholic. He'd left before I was born. Um, his second sentence was, at the age of 13, my mother abandoned me in a, in a, in a, in a shopping centre. This just actually left me there. And for a few years, this 13-year-old drifted through shopping centres, and, and I, I don't know how, how he survived, actually, but he, he did. He said, two years later, at the age of 15, this is the, the, the third and killer sentence, was he said, at the age of 15, I decided I wasn't going to be like my, my uh, parents. It's just an extraordinarily powerful thing for that kid to say. And somehow the Smith family discovered him and, uh, and, and encouraged him and supported him. And he was just about to graduate, and as an ANU graduate, he was just, uh, he was just about to graduate with first class honours uh, out of ANU. It's just a, an extraordinary story. Now, my involvement in this kid's success was minuscule. It was, you know, it was just indirect. Um, but that, that I've got to say to you is one of the proudest moments in my life to actually be associated with an organisation which had had that transformational effect. Um, and I said it you know, in response to David's question, until you actually get into philanthropy and, uh, and, and, and start, start to see what the, the power of making a difference, even indirectly, is, you never really appreciate what the, uh, what the, what the impact is. Um, so, now first of all, let me say thank you for starting us off on that journey. Um, many people will have experienced things like that, I guess, here. In reflecting on this conversation, it strikes me that you've, well, the challenges you've taken on are not about being popular. They're about making a difference. And I, I guess probably what unites everyone in this room, including the, the great work Sarah and her team does, is, is that desire to, to make a difference. Um, but a lot of these things involve you know, grasping quite, quite difficult nettles. Uh, and, and that as willingness to uh, to take on the hard challenges. So, you know, David, thank you for doing that, and for, for your, your your part of my journey. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much, David and Arun. So, just a couple of random thoughts because I just can't help myself. So David, I was lucky enough to go to the Vincent Fairfax Ethics Lecture recently where Shane was the guest speaker. Um, thank you, Jenny and Susan, for including me. Um, and one of the things that Shane said that sort of struck with me, because I think there is a direct parallel to philanthropy, is that out of the 46,000 staff within the bank, 20% of them had customer interfacing roles. So 20% of them had direct customer contact and understood the customers and were working with them, which meant that 80% didn't. And it really made me think then around, well, if 80% of 46,000 people don't have that direct contact with the customer, with the purpose, then you know, no wonder things can get lost in translation. And thinking that into philanthropy about the conversations we're starting to have about participatory philanthropy, you know, how many of us can be really confident that there is an 80% within us that doesn't actually have that citizen-centric, people-focused expertise and relationship to help actually create the right outcomes? So the first part of this morning, Larry kicked us off in style. What a masterful storyteller. I don't know about you, but you know, I sort of felt a bit lulled at the beginning into feeling quite good. He was talking about good practice philanthropy and what it looks like. I'm nodding, I'm saying, yeah, this is accessible, I understand this. And then he dropped a couple of really subtle hints that maybe things were going to get a bit uncomfortable. So when he said, What's the point of being unaccountable if you can't take advantage of it? I'm thinking, oh, OK, it's a bit interesting. But then we all went sort of you know, back into the nodding territory, the Goldilocks rule, fitness for purpose, all that kind of stuff. And then pow, 
straight between the eyes, the big gun comes out and he's talking about reversing a decline in liberal democracy, climate change, and the role of philanthropy as the pivot point, as an agent of change within that mix. So I don't know about you, but I just felt very comfortable and safe and yes and affirmed and then kaput straight into these big questions where you know, his comment that philanthropy won't solve everything, but maybe we won't solve anything without philanthropy really set, came to life. And then he finished with some really practical examples of where their philanthropy is putting that pivot point into the system. And then we've had purpose. You know, this is the human stuff. It's part of us. It's our values. It's our relationships. It's our makeup. And the personal reflections from Maroon and David, thank you both very much. So demonstrating that intelligence and that wisdom and that reflection and personal challenge and personal discomfort with vision. And then finishing up with thinking about, thank you for the question, you know, how much is enough? How much is enough for us as an individual, for us as a community, for us as a country, and then back to Larry, for us as a planet. So thank you both. <laughs>